The planet is restless, Captain. They want their podcast. And they shall have it. I'll beam down to the surface. You have the bridge. Captain, that is illogical. These are Trek fans. They will challenge and dissect your knowledge with great emotion. It is a mission fraught with danger, peril, and grave risk. Suggestions. Send in the red shirts. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we're back. We never retreat. We never surrender. And today we're going to talk about one of the living legends of Star Trek. Yes, that's right. Today we're talking about Star Trek Memories, written by the one, the only, the icon, William Shatner, with help from Chris Kresge. Typically when they say, uh, when they add a, a, a subtitle or a different name on there, that's the guy who really wrote the book. And the guy who's, whose name was on top, he just sat there and just told his stories. But uh, who knows? I, I, I assume William Shatner had a, played a very big part in um, compiling this book. I know he says in the book that he interviewed a lot of people. So uh, be that as it may, uh, I had a chance to download the audio book. Now, I, I had read the book years ago, maybe 99 or something like that. And... Um, I don't know, we've been talking about the Star Trek movies lately, and it just reminded me that this book was still in existence. I downloaded the audio book, and it was like going through it for the first time, because I had forgotten a lot of the things. So it was really fun to read, really fun to listen to, and this is going to be more of a loose form show. I just wanted to share some of the uh, tidbits, some of the little pieces of trivia that Mr. Shatner had to share in his book. Now... Before we get started, uh, I want to introduce my bridge crew. First we have, I'm giving him the position of number one this week. Because he's been very dutiful and very, very, um, uh, what's the word when someone does what you tell them to do? Follows his orders? Obedient. Obedient. He's been very obedient. That would be Craig J. Mr. J, how are you? <laughs> I thought you were going to say Mark was the one who was obedient. He even made it on time to the last show. Well, no, uh, off the, you guys didn't hear this, but we were reprimanded <laughs> <laughs> by Mr. Sexy. So we I had to snap him back in place. <laughs> Did I blink? What? Did I miss that? Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Shelby. I mean, uh, Big Sexy. <laughs> um how are you mr j i am great thank you good how good. are you doing i am great i'm great now yeah. back to um the, the the other crew member who went through the wesley crusher phase where i had to snap him back and i want to lift him up again he's going to get back to lieutenant commander status i think th on this mission i'll let him be the ship's counselor Okay, crickets. Uh, <laughs> that would be Mr. Big Sexy. Sir, how are you? I can't stand Wesley Crusher. Had to get that out. I've hated him from day one. I'm re-watching season one on BBC America, and every time I see him, I just want to stab him. But otherwise, I'm good. Listen, <laughs> I don't think... You're watching season one. I mean, Star, Star Trek Next Generation probably my favorite version of star trek and even i don't have much to say about season one so season one is god awful <laughs> you know it but truly that, is it's only matched by season one of ds9 where we get to hear cisco say ow so <laughs> other than that you know you can yeah, let me that was a little corny <laughs> yeah and we were here and we were drinking lemonade here and uh I love that. I just love doing that. But, but she is fine. So yeah, okay she's yeah, she's all right. Shit. Come on, Q. <laughs> There's been far finer on Star Trek, believe me. Okay, so you and I have to argue this on another forum. All right. All right. <laughs> we have a new segment, a new segment called. Now get this. I, I stayed up all night coming up with this title. Course correction. <laughs> wow. Brilliant. Okay. Oh. Say say that again, Craig. What did you say? I don't think the I don't think the audience heard you. I said brilliant. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so what we're gonna do in this section is we're just gonna go and ruminate 
about some of the things that were said in the previous show that may have been maybe misguided, incorrect, or maybe there just needs to be some clarification. And if you recall, because I know you all listened to the last show, we talked about uh, whether or not Star Trek uh, Search for Spock is actually a better film than Star Trek Wrath of Khan. And based on the downloads, I'm going to suggest that people did not agree with me. <laughs> Trying to tell you. But, hey, you know, this is Q Storm talking here. I, I, I don't back away. I don't surrender. But anyway, if you recall, I used the term and... Big Sexy, you had some, I think there was some laughter on your part. I, I used the it. word tragedian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, say, what? Not even going to try to hide it? <laughs> Jesus. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out that tragedian is a word. However, we were both right and both wrong. It's a word, but it was not used in the proper context by myself. I used it as an adjective when actually it's a noun. It refers to a person who writes tragedies. So. Okay. Okay, well, hold on, hold on. <laughs> let, let, let's, let's delve into that a moment. So a person who writes tragedies is a tragedian. Yeah. As a person so, who writes comedies or performs comedy is a comedian. Oh. Can you give me an example of a tragedian? I would say... Uh, I hate that word. The guy who wrote the the Sophocles trilogy? I can't think of his name, and I'm ashamed. He would be... I would consider him a tragedian. I would consider Shakespeare. Some of his uh, works were tragedy, so he would be a tragedian. Uh, see, again, some of his works were tragedy. I would not... I would assume that a person who writes exclusively like top, like comedian, we'll go with comedian. George Carlin was a comedian. Correct. Kevin Smith is a comedian. But that's not yeah. to say George Carlin never appeared and gave a serious message. Did he ever do anything overtly serious? I don't believe so. Well, I mean, as far as his performance goes. I don't know. I'm just telling you what what Merriam Webster's saying. Jesus. This guy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so we're going to have another course correction about this episode. Jeez. All right, moving on. So, there's a scene in um where in uh Star Trek 3 where uh Bones goes to a cantina and it just put me in the mind of the Star Wars cantina. Just wanted to make that uh throw that out there it does I'm, I'm sure it was meant to be to give you that illusion yeah and i'm thinking like star trek you don't have to try to you don't have to borrow from star wars you, you're you're star trek you, you know you stand on your own you know you're right yeah you're right you know i think that's a lot of the problem with a lot of the star trek things is that they are too influenced by star wars you know we talked about ds9 a few weeks ago that one scene when on the, in the final season where they're on this like sand type of planet, I'm like, that looks like Star Wars. It looks just like well, Star Wars. I mean, it's a sand planet. I wouldn't call that borrowing from Star Wars. A lot, you know, it's a planet. I would. Really? Okay. Who else has done that? Well, I mean, the fact that it's a sand planet has plays into it. It's just the topography of the planet. No, I agree. And again, just like every um, patriotic character for the most part, borrows from Captain America. I mean, that's just how it is. Mm. When Star Wars made that planet, I don't even know what it was called, you know, that sand planet with the little guys in the funny suits running around. Tatooine? How can you say that with a straight face? Ah, we're not going to get into this now. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to leave Star Wars people alone. I, you know, it's um, funny. It, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say that, uh, again, that, to me, when I saw that, I'm like, oh, that's taken right, right from Star Wars. Uh, just, that's like saying if they land on an ice planet, they're stealing that from uh, Star Wars from Hoth. They are. Ah. Wow. Okay. All right, so by, by the same token, then we'll get off of this. By the same token, if if there's a scene in Star Wars where they're on a lush planet with trees, and like uh, Scar Scarif in Rogue One, they're stealing from Star Trek from the Genesis planet. 
have you ever noticed again? I'm not a big Star Wars head, but have you noticed that they never go to warp drive in Star Wars, or do they, they? go to light speed? Light speed. It's the same thing. <laughs> no, it isn't. No, it isn't. Warp Craig. is much faster. Well, okay. Let's <laughs> straighten them out, Craig. Straighten them out. Warp is it, faster. Yeah, it's not the same thing for sure. I mean, how? No. 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 If you go faster than light, that's great. But warp speed is even faster than that. There was one episode, I forget which one it was, but there was an episode in either DS, no, it was DS9, it was, uh, I think, Next Generation or Voyager, the ship is slowing down, warp three, two, sublight, impulse. So, light speed ain't even close to warp, which means the Millennium Dump Truck Falcon has no shot against Voyager. There it is. I said it. Well, I don't know how you. Well, you, you, the both of you seem very confident about that. But light speed, we do. There are some scientific parameters as to what comprises light speed, but we have no. There's no science or no scientific data on warp capability. There is scientific, as in hard sciences, as in the scientific method. No, I, I agree with that. However, but again, you know, in theory, or a lot of these theoretical ph physicists have. You know, made arguments that warp drive well beyond light speed. Well mm. beyond. All right. Which is just like Star Trek is well beyond Star Wars. Michael Dean, I'm talking to you. Wow. There it is. I went there. He's talking to our sponsor. I went there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, that's what you want to do. Prove the sponsor wrong. Okay. <laughs> All right. Edit that out. <laughs> Yeah, Mr. C uh, sponsor who, who, who pays for time on our network, your product <laughs> sucks. <laughs> All right. Real quick, let's just run through these real quick. So, Craig, you were right about one thing. You had mentioned the that, that uh, Kirk and crew, they were expecting the torpedo that Spock was in when they shot him out of the Enterprise onto the planet. They were expecting it to break up in, sp in the atmosphere, and I disagreed with you. Mm. But there is dialogue that indicates they were expecting the torpedo tube to detonate before landing on Genesis in Star Trek Three. Right. So that makes me wonder why Kirk had planned to go back to Genesis if they were thinking that it would have detonated before it landed. It's that's not clear. Oh, if I remember correctly, now it's because Spock's father came in and he had information about the fact that the. Um, but that happened after, that happened after uh, the admiral approached Kirk when they were all lined up, and Kirk says we were we were we were hoping to take the Enterprise back to Genesis, and that's where the admiral tells him no Genesis is a quarantine planet, and so that thing happens before Sarek tells Kirk about the Katra and all that. We'll have to do some research on that one. Yeah, um, I had a question about. Whether or not Spock was having sex at seven years old, uh, no, <laughs> or Vulcans, because uh, uh, Savik says that uh, Vulcans, well, Vulcans have uh, experienced pond fire every seven years. But there's a dialogue that Savik says where that says uh, pond fire affects Vulcans every seven years of their adult life. So that answers that question. Uh, I had a question about why does Sarek sound so assured that Spock melded with Kirk. So in other words, when Sarek shows up at Kirk's place, he's talking to Kirk as if to say, why didn't you bring him back? Why did you betray him, Kirk? Why would Sarek assume that Spock melded with Kirk? Number one, Sarek didn't know what the circumstances were when, when Spock died. So why does he assume that the mind meld was held between Kirk? Why does he even assume that Spock had a chance to mind meld with someone? And why does he assume it happened when it hasn't happened for thousands of years? He comes in there as if it's an everyday occurrence. Would you agree? <laughs> Would you agree? I think you're right about that. Yeah, I mean, they probably didn't think that scene through very well. But I think the uh, the the goal was that Kirk and Spock were very tight friends, and so the theory is that Spock would have mind melded with Kirk because that made the most sense. Well, the reason Bones it... was not the you know Bones was not the choice the right. the first choice there. But yeah, you're right. So you know later on in the movie we find 
when the, the priestess is saying it hasn't been done for thousands of years, <laughs> it sort of nullifies that original scene where he comes in, as he said, and expects Spock to right. be around. Yeah. And it seems like, he seems like he would have come in there talking like, uh, Kirk, is there any chance that Spock touched your face right before he died? Were you there? <laughs> Were you there in the room when he died? Did he touch your face? As opposed yep. to, hey, you got his Katra. Why didn't you bring him to Vulcan? Come on. <laughs> What's the matter with you? <laughs> and the last thing is, in the even though it's a gripping scene, there's a plot hole. that I don't know why this never occurred to me. But when Krug says, and to show my intentions, I will now kill one of the crew. Why didn't Kirk and them beam down <laughs> like they did? When the Enterprise blew up, you know, mm, why didn't they beam down and just stop him? I guess maybe it wouldn't have been fast enough, or I have nothing. I, <laughs> I, I cannot explain that. I should have just shot his ass. And that's what I do. I poke holes in everything. Cue the wet blanket. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but now to the topic at hand. So let me ask you, um, the two of you, have you? Maybe it was a while ago, maybe recently. Did you have a chance to uh, read this book or listen to the audiobook? I read it a long time ago, yes. I Actually, was not aware of it, and I've never, I've never heard an audiobook before. So I, I, When was this book written? Well, I'm glad you asked that. It was originally published in October of 1993 by uh, publisher was HarperCollins. Okay. And it has here listed author William Shatner. Oh, and it says, now listen to this. It says, Star Trek Memories is the first of two volumes of autobiography dictated by William Shatner. I'll see that. I told you. And transcribed by MTV editorial director Christopher Kresge. So, there you have it. Like I said, I just found these things. I, I, I was listening to the audiobook in the car. I always listen to podcasts and my audiobooks while I'm driving. And maybe it's not a good idea, but I was taking notes <laughs> while I was driving. Uh, okay. Kids, kids, don't do that at home. Um, well, actually, no. I was taking notes while I was in my captain's chair. You guys were driving. So, yeah, we're good. We're okay. So, the book starts off at the conclusion of, of Star Trek, after Star Trek, the original series, is canceled. And William Shatner talks about the travails he went through, an unemployed actor. He went back into the stage and local playhouses. He, he produced the play, and he, was, he felt like he was a gypsy. Not a very good term to use nowadays, but you know, traveling back and forth, living out of his truck and his little Winnebago that was attached to his truck. And he says that he was broke and living in this trailer after the show was canceled during this run, during the run of his... Uh, his low-budget um, stage production. And he watched the lunar landing on a small black-and-white TV that was sitting on his chest, laying on his dog, laying using his dog as a pillow. And I just thought it was interesting um, that this guy, who was in three seasons of a very, well, it was very popular, I think, amongst fan fanboys, fangirls, but ultimately it was canceled. And I just, it's just it's kind of depressing to think about this guy who had just undergone a divorce, as well, uh, living out of the back of his truck, and also he he there's a little anecdote he tells about um, he was heading back to L.A. after the run of his play to see his daughters for the first time in months. Now he's now divorced, so he's driving back to L.A. from New York, and on the road his agent calls him and says that he just got an, uh, a very profitable offer to sit with a member of the Kennedy family. They don't, I don't think they mention who, during a big dinner. So this, this member of the Kennedy family was having a large soiree, and this person was a huge fan of Star Trek, and they wanted to pay William Shatner to come sit next to them. But William Shatner apparently was such, was and is, I'm assuming, such a devoted family man, he turned his agent down repeatedly. The agent called him maybe three or four times, and he said, no, no, don't call me again. So when Shatner arrived home on the night of the dinner, the Kennedy dinner, he was so happy to see his daughters and he was going to take them out to dinner because it was the first time he'd seen them in, in months. 
and they said they couldn't go because they had already planned a sleepover. They could, and he, they were hoping they could see him the, the night after. So he lost out on the, on the dinner with the Kennedys, and did not get to spend that time with his daughters. I just thought that was very sad. It is sad. It's very sad. Yes. Yeah. It's sad. It's just bad decision making by an out of work actor. All of this. <laughs> Why? Yeah. You don't have kids, do you? You know, look. I've if turned, there's a choice, you got to go with your kids, man. Obviously. I've turned down work uh, because, like, I couldn't find a babysitter, or I wanted to spend time with my son. I mean, you know, it, it wasn't high paying work. I'll, I'll grant you that. Did Kirk, Kirk, did Shatner, you know, I hate to use, use the phrase, but did Shatner call up, you know, baby mama and say, look, we got some cooking here or what? Or why didn't he just take, you know, I mean, if the, the daughters were older, take them with him. No, they were young. They were young girls. This well, remember like this eight, was in, nine, ten? This is six, I don't remember what age they were, but they weren't, I don't think they were yet teenagers. Oh, shit, they were young girls. Okay. Yeah, they were very young. Well, I think. Baby mama should have stepped in. Well, a baby mama, they were married at one time. They were married when the children were conceived. <laughs> <laughs> now, did any of you guys know that there was talk of a Star Trek Broadway musical? I had heard that. I did not know this. I did not know this. Um, one other thing I found interesting. Now, this is totally meta, but I remember hearing a story recently within the last five years that um, William Shatner was doing some sort of audio recording or VO recording, and the um, the guy who was producing the recording kept correcting him. This was on oh. YouTube or something like that, and I can't remember where I saw this, but I remember the people who, who were responding, they were saying how gracious Shatner was because this young upstart producer had some nerve correcting William Shatner and I tended to agree but then listening to him read because I'm also not uh, I finished reading uh, listening to this book I'm listening to Star Trek memories where he re writes about the original series William Shatner does have a problem pronouncing words <laughs> <laughs> he pronounces the word renaissance as in the period of time in France and uh, in Europe that was a, a rebirth of arts and uh, philosophy and enlightenment. He pronounces that word renaissance. So there's emphasis on nay. So that's just a little weird. Actually, thing. A, lot of, a lot of people pronounce it that way. They do? Yeah. I've never heard that. Maybe it's a British slash French thing or something. Now, <laughs> well, he's neither, so. Well, he's Canadian, but. He's Canadian. Um, yeah. So I wonder, is that how they pronounce it in Canada? Maybe. Okay, well, uh, in future shows, you, I'm going to reveal how you pronounce his other words, which s struck me as odd. Now, I did not know this either, but apparently Leonard Nimoy and Gene Roddenberry did not get along during the uh, production of Star Trek. Were any of you aware of that? I was not aware of that. You know, I didn't hear that on this particular, you know, episode, or episode particular film, but I heard of some catty behavior between those two before, though. Well, I know in the book I'm reading slash listening to now, uh, there's a whole ch a section devoted to Nimoy's struggles with the studio and with Roddenberry. And we're going to get into that later uh, in a later show. But um, one of the things that caused Nimoy's relationship to completely erode with Roddenberry was that after the cancellation of the show, Roddenberry started licensing blooper reels of Star Trek. And he made money off that, and Nimoy was upset that, one, he wasn't getting paid off of that. And two, he felt like it was damaging to his brand as an actor that, you know, people were able to see his mistakes. And I think uh, he wasn't the only one on the crew that felt that way, but... It just seems like a really sad way, sad reason for their relationship to completely mm. deteriorate. But you know what I'd love? I've seen copies of those blooper reels, and they're terrible, terrible quality. I wish somebody would step up who purchased one of the original ones and just convert it properly so we can actually see them properly. Have you ever seen any of those blooper reels? I have not. 
they are terrible. I mean, the quality is just terrible. It's like a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy kind of thing. Really? It was yeah. I'd love I'd love to find the a nice clean copy of the blooper reels. That would be great. Well, apparently this um, they would save all the bloopers. There's a lot of actually a lot of corporations. I've done a lot of these myself. The studio would um, save all of the bloopers and s- string them together for the Christmas party, like for a, you know for a cast party at, at the holidays. Oh and, yeah. And Jean was like, "Yeah, let me make, I'll make a quick buck." Hmm. So. Uh, another little fact that um, maybe some truckers out there knew, I did not. Uh, in the motion picture, originally Gene Roddenberry wrote the character of Chekhov as the captain of the Enterprise in the motion picture, not Decker. I was not aware of that. I how was you, not either. How do you it think actually would... makes more sense, actually. You know, the, somebody from the ship gets promoted as opposed to some random captain coming in. Well, again, maybe, yeah, I was going to say maybe Decker was a crewman on the Enterprise that we just never heard from, but it would have been a well, bridge crew member. You would think a bridge crew member would be promoted, right? Yeah. I'd love, to, I'd love to, we should do a bit of research on the Decker character and find out why why he was written into that script. Uh, I think they, did they go in? Yeah, Shatner doesn't have much to say about, um, I forget the actor's name. What's his, what's his name? From uh, Seventh Heaven? Can't think of his name. Oh, that guy! Did he end up being a perv? Well, yeah, I, don't, I see no need to disparage the man. <laughs> the man did it to himself. Ah, I can't think of his name. I can see his face, but um. So can I. So yeah. me nuts now. <laughs> Here's a little funny tidbit, and, and it's well, it's not really that funny because he almost died. But um, if you remember at the end of the motion picture, the V'ger set was this huge amazing set but it was it was not built on the floor of the stage it was elevated <clears throat> and some of the panels that comprise the floor of V'ger you know when they're walking down um, towards the platform that the uh, that the space module is sitting on mm-hmm. some of those panels were hollow like they were just I, I'm assuming they were paper or something that would not sustain weight and the crew they were the actors were all warned of that but Shatner you know, Shatner's going to Shatner. And he just started hopping on what he thought were the solid portions of the V'ger set. And he hit the wrong panel and fell through. And um, underneath the set, it was all the electrical wiring and circuitry and everything. And prior to him falling through on, an, on another day of shooting, uh, um, an ele- uh, crewman or a stagehand fell through and was nearly electrocuted. So Shatner fell through and had to hang on until some until they could get over there safely and lift him up. Crazy. So he says that he almost died that day. Can I imagine. Now, we all love Gene Roddenberry, right? We love the guy. He created this this uh this franchise that we all know and love. But can we honestly can we just keep it 100 and say that at some point, he kind of needed to just step aside. Oh, God, yes. Well, here's proof of that. So, in Star Trek Three, Gene wanted the, the the central concept to be about Spock after he dies, I guess, or something happened. I don't know how this would happen. He wanted it to be about Spock going back in time to assassinate JFK. Makes no sense. I guess he's thinking that rather than Spock coming back to life, he goes through a time warp or something. And but why would Spock want to do that? And ironically, um, of course, the studio said no, we're not doing that. And he at this time Roddenberry was kind of being shuffled to the side. He was like executive producer, or he had some title and name only. And they would listen to his ideas, but ultimately not act on them, which is again really sad. But he held on to that idea and, and represented it for Star Trek IV, which, as we all know, he did not do. They did not do. Although they did do time travel. so They did time travel, but I assume that's what motivated him to come back and say, hey, let's do this story. Right. But, but speaking of which, uh, Star Trek Three and Star Trek IV, what makes those two unique is that 
Star Trek Four picks up exactly where Star Trek Three left off, which I don't yeah. think we don't see that anywhere else, do we? Mm, I'm thinking about it, but I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. No, I don't think we see that necessarily in any of the original series either. We talked about this briefly in Star Trek Three, but um, when Kirk hears the news that David was killed, and he steps back and he trips and hits the floor. So it turns out that that was an accident. And when when it happened, he thought that it would be good to incorporate that into the character. So he went over to Nimoy and said, you know, I want to try this. And Nimoy was worried about him hurting himself, but he but Shatner insisted. So um, they did it and they did six takes. And Shatner says that he got very bruised. But he, and this is from the words of William Shatner, he thinks that was Kirk's finest moment ever. What do, you, what do you guys think of that? That's Those are pretty heavy words. It's certainly a powerful scene. There's no question about that. I mean, it's he, he, it shows it shows this powerful captain who taken off balance for a second there, you know. I wouldn't go quite that far. But, you know, again, a lot of times I've learned, especially with this, you know, Star Trek cast, I've said it before, I'll say it again, there's a lot of cattiness around. Now, I'm not an actor. You know, I have a good friend who's an actor and another who's a director, and I've been around both film sets and theater productions, and they take shots at each other like that. So it well, doesn't what, surprise what you, me. What are you referring to? Who, who, what are you, refer- you know, who else is fine as that world? <laughs> that's not cool. <laughs> well, what do you mean? That's, no, how, this, that's this, how I took it. This is Shatner saying that he felt like exposing that side of Kirk and his reaction was his finest moment. This is Shatner reflecting on his own performance. I stand corrected. No, I, t- well, I stand corrected in that regard. But again, any person who could say that about you know the character he's known for playing mm-hmm. in a franchise that he really, at that point, hadn't truly embraced. You know because what? Kirk was. Well, I'm going to get to it because Shatner was the one. You know, after the show went off the air, you know, way back when, mm-hmm. they did a couple of movies, okay. Then they announced Next Generation, and this guy was just bitter about it. He was. I, uh, bitter's a strong word. Bitter's an accurate word. I mean, he'd go on, you know, what was it, SNL? Yeah, get a life. <laughs> I'm not going to watch it when it comes out. Dude, what is your problem, man? And did, did so he, for him... Did he really say what? that? Because I, I, maybe he presented different faces because I... All the stuff. When the show thought. first was announced, uh-huh. you know, people are you know talking about, oh, we're gonna do another Star Trek, blah blah, and then it you know it's announced and, and dates are set to air and all that. They go to him. I'm not gonna watch it. Oh, really? You big hater. <laughs> you know. But a lot of people, you know, maybe I, I hear where you're coming from, but a lot of actors and people in in the industry they tend not to look at other references because they either want to preserve what they are familiar with or they don't want the other references or sources to to um, influence their treatment. No, I so could that's, see that's, that's, that's if it was... Thing. I could see him saying that about this J.J. J. Abrams crap on this Kelvin universe oh, yeah. garbage. <laughs> but these are completely different characters set out in the future and they even got McCoy to be a little cameo in that first episode. So Kirk, or Kirk, Shatner, let it go, man. I mean, granted, he came around eventually, but so I'm looking at him in 93, guy was still full of hater aid, man. <laughs> well, Shatner was, a, he had a very strong personality. Let's, and let's put it that way, because I, I Most still, actors do. Okay, I still hold out hope that he will come on this show. <laughs> so Did you tweet at him? You, you need to tweet it, uh, William Shatner, and ask him. Maybe he'll he'll respond to you. Well, I, yeah. I know you, I know that you did with the because you you had the privilege of taking a photo with him, and I don't think he responded. So no, he, but that was only one time. I, I know. I, I just didn't want to. Yeah. You know, I don't want to over. You know, I don't want to overstep. But anyway, you know, Shatner's going to Shatner, and I can't say that I'm mad at him. <laughs> oh, speaking of Shatner, <laughs> one one thing you, you love the guy, right? But he he has the nicest way of making most things about him. 
Because <laughs> the next tidbit, uh, he says that at one point during the uh, shoot, the shooting of Star Trek Three, after a day of shooting, uh, one of the sets next to the Enterprise set caught fire. And Shatner, he 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 goes on this thing about how he found the fire extinguisher and start and and was very instrumental in putting it out before the fire fireman came. <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? I want to think he did. <laughs> so then we I'm move, sure he did. I, I I have no doubt. I have no doubt at all. So then we move on to Star Trek Four, and this was interesting. Apparently, um. The Paramount lot, there used to be a large water tank that was set on it. And I think the maintenance of the, I think he said the maintenance of the tank got to be too costly. So they paved over it years, you know, eons ago. They paved over it and turned it into a parking lot. And Nimoy, after getting the directing gig, realized that, you know, he had a choice between shooting in the ocean and dealing with cost overruns. And then he found out about this tank that was buried underneath the parking lot and he said it was cheaper for Nimoy to dig up that tank and fill it up, refurbish it, fill it up with water and shoot the whales, the, the animatronic whales in that tank rather than shoot in the ocean. And I, you know, someone who has always aspired to work in film, such as, you know, talking about myself, I just found that just amazing that, you know, it's cheaper to, to dig up the parking lot as opposed to just going into a body of water right there but then you think about then you think about spielberg shooting bruce the great white in in the ocean and jaws and all the stuff he went through and then you realize mm. eh, maybe Who it doesn't make sense bruce? to do that wasn't that the name of the shark <laughs> i forgot that wow <laughs> oh i've forgotten that one i'm just curious <laughs> if, if they paved back over it or if they left it out if they kept it out good question so, there wasn't much about Star Trek 4 that I found that interesting in terms of what Shatner had to say. But um, Star Trek 5, this was very interesting. So, we all know that Shatner, through the urging of Nimoy, okay, so you could say Nimoy is either to blame or Nimoy gets all the credit. Shatner's inspiration for Star Trek 5 and its religious overtones, uh, noticeably in Cybok, the the guy who gets people to relieve their pain. That movie, or that treatment, was inspired by Shatner watching Jim and Tammy Faye Baker on TV. And <laughs> he says that he was amazed at how these people could be so arrogant to think that God would talk to them directly. And so that's how he came up with the character of... Um, that's how he... Well, that, he doesn't relate that directly to Cybok, but one can see that that's why he wanted to take that approach with Star Trek V, or where he got the inspiration for. Mm. That makes sense. The thing is, is that sometimes, you know, you really have to flesh an idea out before you just you just go to Paramount and say, this is the basis of my story. But apparently they bought it. The whole comparison to Jim and Tammy Faye makes me laugh because I'm glad that somebody or another person called people like them out on their bullshit because again you know I'm looking at the quote now the arrogance to think that God would speak to them directly and then to try to monetize that which is what he is still doing to this day it's like come on man and then again back in the 80s when a lot of these uh, televangelists got busted what was my man's name Jimmy Swagger right. got caught with a hooker <laughs> on his show in tears I have sinned or my my other man uh, oh what was it Earl Roberts Jr who said flat out if I don't get X million the Lord's gonna call me home and the FCC's like hold on there player you can't say that so the fact that someone especially on a large platform like the Star Trek franchise took a shot at these cats I'm okay with it I'm glad yeah, people too. done it. Yeah, yeah, it was it was it was great to hear that that was the inspiration. I just wish a better movie could have come of it. Does now, anybody know if any religious groups complained about just the storyline in itself? Not 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 even the fact that it was based on those two, but just the fact that it's appears to be anti-religious. I wonder if any religious groups freaked out about it at the time. I don't recall that. 
I, you know, the movie got critically panned. Well, I know. Well, he says that the the movie got good reviews, some good reviews at the beginning, but it just it didn't really make that much money. So maybe no one thought to look at it to to see what it was about. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Um, some other uh, facts about Star Trek Five. On the first day of shooting, on the side of the mountain, when they're um, chat so. Shatner or Kirk is climbing mountain climbing and this is the scene where uh, Spock comes up beside him in his jet boots or whatever oh yeah <laughs> so William Shatner again being the badass that he is he reveals that he has a fear of heights but he insisted that they needed to get shots with him actually on the side of a mountain and he regretted um, saying that he was willing to do that um, but now, I don't know, I don't remember if this was on the side of the actual mountain in California, because some of that scene was shot in one of the, uh, one of the, the Yosemite forest, I guess, I've, I don't, I don't know what it was, I forget what it was called, uh, but a, a national park in California, but other parts of it were shot in a stage where the, um, the set was set at a 90 degree, it was 90 degrees to the floor. And I don't, I think it was during the actual mountain, the location stuff, where he says the sound man revealed to him that he was kind of timid, but wanted to tell Shatner that it sounded like he was rushing his lines. And so, and he, Shatner says that the sound man said, he said it sounded like Captain Kirk was late for work. And at the <laughs> end of the day, uh, when Shatner was looking at the dailies, he had to agree. So I just want to say hats off to this sound man for having the balls to go to Shatner and say, listen, your lines aren't really, you're not really reading your lines very well. You're too, you're, you're going too fast. I mean, I can, I can understand that that takes a lot of courage because, you know, you're dealing with the guy who pretty much launched this franchise. And so maybe Shatner was um, a little bit nervous about hanging off the mountain. That's probably what it was. Oh, you know what? You just reminded me. Uh, that's a good observation. Uh, I don't know if he was nervous about hanging off the mountain, but he was nervous. He does say, or he does write, he was nervous because he was worrying about uh, if they were going to get all the shots in time, uh, if they were uh, going to go over budget. Uh, he was, you know, he was worried about being a director and an actor. So he, you know, he wasn't really consciously thinking about how he was, how his performance was coming off. Mm. Now, this one was the most interesting to me. <laughs> and I, I listened to it a couple times. I think I got it right while I was transcribing my notes. So, the original idea that Shatner had in his treatment was that he wanted the Enterprise crew to travel to hell. <laughs> that's how religious <laughs> That's how religious he wanted this film to be. He said there was going to be a scene with the Enterprise crew members traveling on the river Styx. There were going to be angels and demons in battle at the end. And at one point, they were going to be running from the battle, like Kirk, Bones, Spock. I don't know if Uhura and Chekhov were going to be there. But Bones was going to break his leg or something and get be incapacitated and knocked out. And then this huge demon was going to come up out of the ground and grab Bones and take him down to hell. Well, let's be very glad that they did not do that. I got to tell you, Craig, I would pay I would pay a year's salary to see that bootleg. <laughs> <laughs> How yeah, horrible that's, does that sound? That is not Star Trek. There's no way. Well, you know, the further you get from Star Trek... The weirder it gets, because when I saw that paragraph in the uh, memories tidbits, I see the river sticks. I immediately think of the band. So I'm thinking <laughs> them on on the river, and you and they're floating down, burning up, and there was stick singing, you know, Mr. Roboto. <laughs> <laughs> who was the guy who sang uh, in the early '80s? Don't pay the ferryman. That's who I think. Of. Uh, Chris DeBerg. That's who I think. Of. Oh God, woman in red. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, cause, you know, when I think of the River Sticks, I think of I forget the guy's Acheron. Is that his name? The guy who 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 um, 
who steers the boat into the gates of hell. That's who I think of. Anyway. Yeah. Moving on with that, that, that concept, that original concept. The ending, the original ending of Star Trek V went from angels and demons fighting the crew to an army of rock men. So, when they're on the planet where Kirk and crew meet, quote unquote, God, that originally was supposed to be, there was supposed to be an alien presence who was going to cause these huge rock creatures to come up out of the ground. And I forget, Kirk wanted like 20 of them. He wanted like an army. But the budget was so tight that the studio gave Shatner only enough money for one rock man. So already you can see that this is not going well. So, yeah. <laughs> so on the set, Shat, you know, they were worried. He was worried because how am I going to make one rock man, one guy in a latex suit or whatever? The suit? It was going to be a guy in a suit. And he was concerned. And I think he said like the night before, they had like a bunch of stagehands smoking cigarettes and blowing the smoke into the suit because he wanted smoke like steam coming off the rocks as it was coming out of the pits of hell, I guess. And he was really worried. He didn't get any sleep that night. The next day, they, they go into the scene, and Shatner's fighting this rock guy. And um, he was very happy with what he saw on set, that the rock guy looked really scary, looked very convincing. But then when he got to the screening room and saw the dailies, <laughs> he said it looked horrible. <laughs> so I'm thinking of, who's the guy in uh, Power Rangers? The purple guy? Any Power and I watch Power Rangers. Uh, no, Q, and you just lost another man card. <laughs> no, but remember when the X-Men came out? The X-Men um, with um, Apocalypse, and everyone was making fun that he, the Apocalypse looked like this character from Power Rangers. Anyway, that's what I picture. I can't picture the guy's name. Man but, card um, revoked. What's that? Man card revoked. Uh, I, yep. I, I got a young kid. What do you want? <laughs> don't, don't put it on the kids, Q. <laughs> Power Rangers was 30 years ago, man. Don't put it on the kids. Ah. So basically, what Shatner ended up with, and he wasn't happy with it, was that he ended up with the big old guy face who's supposed to be God. And he says, basically, we went from from an army of rock men. No, he went from angels and demons to an army of rock men to one rock man to a face lit with a projector. So he wow. wasn't very happy with that. Wow. <laughs> I remember, I did remember when I saw that uh, in the theaters, I didn't necessarily have a problem. I thought the effect looked pretty cool. I mean, the screen was filled with this light blue face, and it was pretty impressive. It's just what they did with it, you know? Well, you know, just reading this, hearing these quote-unquote rock men, that just sounds bad. And then, And again, back in that time period they weren't doing cgi and they weren't really getting into it like they do now so yeah i could see how it would look bad on the dailies well I, did any of you see galaxy quest remember that movie oh god years ago for sure there's a scene in that movie where they land on a planet and there are these rock creatures that fight them and i'm wondering if that was an homage to this to mm. them knowing that so maybe one of the one of those guys, one of the producers of that film, had to be a Star Trek fan because it's totally a ripoff of Star Trek or a parody of Star Trek. And it is definitely a parody for sure. I wonder if uh, that was an homage to this behind the scenes knowledge. But um, could be. This is another interesting story. At the beginning of shooting, the first day of Star Trek V, uh, there was a Teamster strike. Teamsters. They're the union. They're like the, they're like the the workhorses. They they uh, drive the trucks, set up the generators, uh, they rig things. They're, they're like the backbone of the production. They're the the big, beefy guys. Um, there was a strike, so the crew, the production team, decided to go with non-union teamsters. Now we all know, that when you break the line. That doesn't make the problem. union too happy. But they weren't worried about that. Shatner was like, ah, oh, we got to get this thing done. So they're loading up all the trucks and preparing to drive out into the desert to shoot the, um, the mountain climbing scene. And just mysteriously, one of the trucks blew up. <laughs> so 
This is the first day of shooting. So they started driving. They started pulling out. So the other trucks started pulling out. And during the ne- over the course of the next few days, they noticed that cars full of masked men would follow them. So people started like, I'm not driving the truck today. <laughs> and what happened was the studio had to call in a police escort to get to the mountain location for those for the remaining shoot days. Crazy. You know, I, I don't know if I'm going to swallow that one because... Granted, this wasn't the age of social media, but I think we would have heard more about that. I mean, I've never heard about that until now. So if they're blowing up trucks on set like, you know, Tony Soprano would, I think we would hear more about it. Well, now, and also, you have to realize Hollywood, well, a lot of people, Hollywood and Washington, D.C., they have a different terminology for they They overstate things. So yeah. when he says blowing up, I take that to mean the engine just caught fire, maybe. There wasn't an okay. explosion. Okay, fine. I, I'm just guessing. Okay. Because, to your point, if 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 a truck literally blew up, uh, you know, like a fireball, I, I think that would have made national news. And I would have remembered that. But, anyway. Uh, so, moving on to Star Trek VI. Uh, a few things he had to say about that. Uh, and this is where the book leaves off. It doesn't go into it. It hints at uh, Star Trek Seven, but as we all know, Star Trek Six was uh, directed by Nicholas Meyer. But at one point, he was ready to uh, walk away because he heard at a dinner party or something that his budget had been cut. No one had contacted him. Now the original budget was thirty million dollars, which is unfathomable to me to think about that exactly but he heard through a third party they were talking or someone was mentioning that yeah the budget is 25 million dollars for this picture and so he called up the studio and was like what the hell's going on i can't do this picture for 25 million dollars and he was ready to walk well what happened was the studio hired a new chief and his name is was stanley jaffe and nick myers was like eff it and Jaffe called him because Jaffe was a Star Trek fan. And he was like, oh, yeah, you got the $5 million back. No problem. Get to get it shot. So we almost did not have Nicholas Meyer directing this film. Any thoughts on that? You should have gone to 35. <laughs> you know, yeah, I don't, I don't think it really went down like that either. You know, if you got 30, okay, initially, and they all of a sudden, you know what, we're going to get 25 and bite me. And then the studio comes up with a new head and this Jaffe guy who apparently, I mean, he's the head, so he's got some pull, but he just went out of his way. You know what? Here's your 30. Go do what you do. No. You don't think no. that happened? Why, why, why I, do you... don't, I, don't, I don't think it would happen over that small of a discrepancy. Now, if they gave him 30 and cut it to 15, yeah, I see somebody stepping in. But, you know, the extra five, what could, I mean, did you see a difference? In terms of? I mean, because there wasn't really a lot to it that you could say that was really enhanced by another $5 million. Maybe salaries and, you know, behind the, what do you call it, un, behind, under the line things. Above, yeah, above the line. That, above the line things and, you know, catering and other things. But as far as, like, actual content... Well, it may not have been content. It may have been because, it, and that was another reason why they were thinking of. Um, I think, and uh, forgive me, I don't remember. I, I don't remember all the details, but I believe part of it was would have been actors' salaries. It was getting too expensive to, uh, to for for all the crew because you had a what six member crew or six leads, if you will. You know, again, and I'm not ripping Star Trek. I love Star Trek. A lot of these casts, other than Kirk, what have they done besides Star Trek? So when you have six leads, these leads better know where their bread is buttered, and don't be you know should be making waves. I don't think it's what you've done, but you know good and well, you cannot shoot a Star Trek movie and Nichelle Nichols isn't there. You can't shoot it and Walter Koenig's not there or Jimmy Duan's not there. So they know it's not about it's not about what they've done they don't have to build themselves up for their salaries they know that they are crucial to star trek 
No, they are crucial, but, but again, these movies have not been making Star Wars money either. So it's not like a studio can't say, you know what, we're not making no money. Let's just cut our losses, which is you know part of the reason maybe they came in and said cut it from thirty to twenty five. Yeah, but again, you got to look. You got to remember what, when this movie was made. I, I don't remember off the top of my head what year, but is it, it was I think it was like early well it was early nineties. But um, you 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 can't judge standards then by today. You know. No, true, true. Again, you're right. I have to, you have to look at it, you know, I do. I have to look at it through the lens of that time period. If my budget was cut by $5 million, I could, I would walk too. I mean, $5 million, you know, that that may have been uh, Sulu by himself. you got to have Sulu in there. Oh, no way! <laughs> I'm joking, but w- wait a minute. Now, that brings up a question. What do you think each of these guys was making? I mean, I'm, I'm sure Shatner was making the most. I'm and sure Nim- Nimoy out. and Shatner were probably on the same level. Yeah, Nimoy and Shatner were making the most. And I'm going to guess that if, you know, again, if they had good representation, I know I would put in a favorite nations clause for my client. So if I'm not Nimoy or Shatner, I'm, you know, anyone else on the bridge crew, I would have it in my contract that no one gets paid more than me. So if you guys want to give you know, check off five million, that's fine. After I've already signed for three million, that's fine. My thing kicks up to five million. We call that a favorite nations clause. I, I, I like it. I could see Koenig and Nichelle Nichols maybe getting two mil a piece. What year was this movie made? I remember it was in the early nineties because I was working for Notre Dame. Really? That's when I saw the movie. I took a. Oh yeah, duh. You're an Indiana dude, duh. Okay. It has one. I'm thinking Rudy now. (laughs) You know, it's funny you say that. I actually shot behind the scenes of that shoot of that production for HBO. No way! I love that movie. I got to meet the real Rudy. Hilarious guy. That's so cool. Uh, 1991. Okay, so 91. Let's assume that Chekhov and Uhura got two million. Based and again, I'm trying to put numbers on the, with a formula that I I can't really validate. Then if I'm Kirk, and they're getting two, I want five. I could see that easily. So let's think about that then. So you got Kirk and Spock getting five apiece. That's ten. That's ten. So you got Bones, Scotty, Chekhov, Uhura, and Sulu at two apiece. So that's twenty right there in salary. Uh uh-uh. uh. That didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, you're right. But, but, but no what, you're, what you've just proven is that that five million was critical. If they got a budget of thirty, you're still not spending twenty on salary for six people or seven people. There's no way. <laughs> that that means what you're saying is uh, Nichelle Nichols and Walter Cannon got a per diem, and that was it. And cap fair. <laughs> I'm not saying they got a per diem cap fair. <laughs> Maybe Kirk and Spock got two each, and then the rest of them got one. I could see that selling, you know, just based on the thirty and twenty-five million dollar, you know, line there. Yeah. But I can't see Kirk and Spock getting ten million of the, you know, a whole third going to those two. Yeah. No. It doesn't sound. I mean, I I've never I've I've put together budgets for for shoots, but not anywhere near this level. So I. I I would only be speculating. Maybe the effects didn't cost as much as I would think they would. Maybe the effects only cost a couple million. And or maybe maybe the five was needed for the effects. I don't know. I'd love to I'd love to see some spreadsheets though. Yeah. The effects yeah. the effects in Star Trek Six were pretty good. If you remember the purple Klingon blood floating I know, around right? and and the you know, just the planet, the, they they dressed it up really well. It looked really convincing. So I think they spent a lot of money on that. Yeah. And if you also think about it further, wasn't Worf in that one? He was. But he probably so if, got 200 wait, wait, grand wait, wait. easy. 200 if I'm grand. Worf coming off of seven years of Next Generation and about to go to DS9, oh, hell no. <laughs> you know, I've earned my stripes. No, no. I'm not saying I want Kirk money. I'm not saying that. But you need to kick me up a little something. Now, granted, he wasn't in it that long. But 
you got you got to bump him a little something too. If he made more than a couple hundred thousand dollars, I'd be surprised. He only had the one scene, so yeah, yeah, I, I'll, I'll go with that. I would be willing to guess that he made more than he did on an episode of. Um, oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah. But I mean, he, uh, he wasn't making that Seinfeld Friends money per episode. No, no, no. All right, now this I found very interesting, and I wish they would have done this. Now just check this out. The original concept for Star Trek VI was that Kirk and crew would be depicted as younger characters in Starfleet Academy who were thrown into some sort of conflict. See, right there we have a problem. I hate when they de-age people, which is why I hate the Kelvin universe. You're assuming that they all knew each other in Starfleet Academy, which is not the case. Because when you look at it, when you have an entire group of seven people all in the same academy class, then they all end up on the same ship. F*** out of here. No, no, wait, but wait, 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 wait. We don't know how Starfleet works completely. Maybe as cadets or, or whatever, maybe what happens is... Uh, maybe I'm reaching here, but... Maybe Starfleet puts their crews together and they train them together because they know they're going to be working together on any given ship. Is okay, that possible? based on that, that's that's possible. But this is Spock, considerably older than the rest of them, and he was already on the ship before any of them got there. Well, that brings up a question: Is is um, and Craig, you can speak to this. Uh, the events of the cage is that considered canon? Well, I guess it would be because mm, they used that, Yeah, they used that footage in what was it, the Menagerie? Yes. So that makes definitely it canon. canon. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah I yeah, think yeah. they recognize that. Uh, the Enterprise had been around for five years before Kirk came along. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, so maybe... Uh, I don't know how you get around that. You're right. Well, he doesn't go into detail. Maybe they had a, a reason for that. Maybe uh, Spock was... Um, maybe you could say Spock was there doing an inspection or something. or you know, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. <laughs> But anyway, the concept was that they were younger characters, which I'm not, I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem. Wait, wait, wait. Let's think about that. Look at that even further. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, Chekhov is the youngest of all of them. So there's no way he'd be in their class. Well, no one's saying that he would be in their class. I mean, if you're in high school and I could see getting into some sort of situation or scenario, I'm a senior and you're a sophomore. Okay. Then when you when you look at the whole I, the premise of them being in a class together or being trained together as a group, they the they do that at the academy because that was alluded to in DS Nine when Nog was in the academy and he joined Red Squad, you know the little upper level of Wesley Crusher like cadets who everyone hated. So if that was the case, I could see that, but to not ever allude to it in the shows or in the films and then just hit us with it? Nah, man, that's bullshit. <laughs> Craig, what do you think? I agree. And plus, I would have hated that Star Trek flashback to young people oh, and stuff. Oh, I, hate I, I, right watch Star, I would be watching Star Trek Six to see my favorite Star Trek characters again, not some other actors playing younger versions of them. Well, that's what we have in the uh, Kelvin universe. That's why it sucks. <laughs> well, but, but, but what I was going to say was I don't have a problem. I like the, the, the concept. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't that upset when they announced that was the concept for the Abrams films. Because, you I know, the, act, the actors are getting older. So you got to either, if you want to stay in the Kirk framework, you got to... But see, go, why go, go back to that? You know, because, because Kirk is a popular character. That's um, why. No, no, Kirk is an iconic character. That's right. that's a given. But like you said, he's getting old. And for anyone to try to recreate that and capture that sense of macho, it just isn't going to work. That's why Rick Berman, when he came on for Next Generation, you know, on the second season, I believe, the show stopped looking like the original series. And they're like, let's embrace these new cats and build upon them and let them do something new. So going back to that universe, you know, the original universe, and then, well, it's not really the universe. It's like a side universe where, you know, they're all young. F*** out of here, man. And then as we, as we talked before, 
the characters aren't the ones that we know. You know, you got too much mouth on the bridge from Uhura telling the captain what she's going to do and not do. Wait a minute. Wait get a minute. out of here. See, th that's what I'm trying to get out of here. I don't have a problem seeing these characters portrayed by younger actors. Nah. But what I have a problem with is what J.J. Abrams did, and you're not really seeing Kirk, Spock, Bones at all. Um, that's E.T. dot A.L. dot. You're an attorney. You, you know what that means, right? I know that. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I, I didn't mind when they said that uh, the Abrams version of Trek was going to have younger people. I didn't have a problem with that. I thought that was going to be interesting, if not somewhat daunting. But what I have a problem with is when I'm not seeing the actor portray Kirk as I'm used to Kirk being portrayed, where he's seems a little bit less confident and all this having to live up to the traditions of his dad, all that stuff. So you think about what you just said. Yeah. A less confident Kirk, right. that's not possible. I know, but that what I'm saying is not so possible. there's nothing, there's no problem. I don't have a problem with seeing Kirk, Bones, and Spock portrayed by younger actors. As long as they give me the 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 character the, the, the mannerisms and the the things that make Kirk, Spock and Bones those characters, which they're not doing in uh Abrams Trek. So I'm not gonna judge. You you may have had like if you had, had Chris Pine, Zachary Quinto and what's his name? Uh who does the best job of imitating. What's his uh Carl Urban. If let's say that they were going to play these younger characters, um, I wouldn't have a problem with that if they would portray Kirk, Spock, and Bones the way Shatner and uh, Nimoy did. And you see, that's on the director squarely because a lot of times, especially in sci fi and now comic movies, a director will come in, No, I have a vision for these characters that's different. Dude. These characters outdate you. You shouldn't come around dicking around with them. So when they did that, you lose me. You know, you lose me. They, they did it with, you know, Fantastic Four. They did it in a lot of other movies. I'm like, you know what? No, I know what these characters are. Apparently, you don't as a director. Now, the question is, do I have to bleep out the word dicking? No. No. Nah. <laughs> now, it's not used in a, in a, you know, obscene sense. As in horsing around, as right. in to change without you know, well, you know, rational basis, not any sexual content. Leave it in. I think what I'll do is I'll bleep out the ick part, so it'll be dip beep. <laughs> you <woozy>. oh. <laughs> <laughs> So moving on, so Star Trek Six, it would have shown started off showing the crew as we know them, the present day crew, in various modes of retirement, and what was. What I thought was funny was Uhura was going to be seen as host of a Federation radio talk show. What? Wow. <laughs> and the setup was that Kirk, Shatner's Kirk, was going to be giving a speech at Starfleet. And he would reminisce about an event in his past. And then the movie would then flash back to the younger crew. And at some point, you would see that Kirk back then was really uh, was in a relationship with some woman. I don't know if he said it was uh, Carol Marcus or not. And then at the end of the film, they would flash forward back to the present day, and it would have uh, Spock and Kirk at the gravesite of Kirk's that his true love that we had seen in the flashback. Useless. I would never watch that. I think that's. A, I would have liked to have seen that. I got no because the, most of the movie would have been the younger the younger characters, and you would have, it's the the original characters are playing bit pieces. Silly. Yeah. Uh, I hate it. I mean, but the thing is, you know, it's it's kind of like you see Kirk at the beginning of Generations, and then you see him for what what twenty minutes at the end. Well, I know because I think Generations was more of a handing over movie. Right. Well, I think we all knew that. But but I, I take this to mean when he tells about this, when he recounts the story, I take it to mean that this would have been a handing off to the younger characters, so that maybe they were going to do continue the franchise. With these, mm -hmm. with these actors. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Gosh. Not buying it. Okay. Hell no. All right, so, let, so we're going to wrap up here. I just have three more. Um, I've always had the notion that, um, you know, we've always talked about my, how I view Klingons, how they represent, you know, African-Americans, uh, 
Yeah, to a certain degree. And one of the things I've always pointed to was Nichelle Nichols refusing to say the line that Chekhov says, guess who's coming to dinner when uh, the Klingons beam on board the Enterprise for the dinner party on Star Trek VI. But actually, that's not the line she refused to say. She what? Appa- apparently, during that scene in the transporter room, they talk about how the Klingons are kinder and gentler. And then Nichelle Nichols was to have said, but would you want your daughter to marry one? And she flatly refused to read the line. Kindler? Did I say? Yeah, kind, kind, kinder. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but the Klingons, the Klingons were always supposed to be um, Blood the Russians. Yeah. I know. Yeah, so I, I never saw them as that they were specific to a race. They were always the Russians, the bad guys. No, right. That's why they've got the rankings like Russian rankings, you know. No, that, and, and that's what um, I think Shatner mentions that during the book. But, you know, people are gonna people will see subtext where it's not intended, you know. The other thing, and I, I agree with William Shatner about this. There's a line in Star Trek VI where that he's talking to some Star Trek, Star Trek, some Starfleet official. Or maybe he's talking, I think he's talking to, um, to Spock. Yes, he he's talking to Spock. They're having a discussion about why Spock wants him to go, you know. And yeah, and Shatner says yeah. he says he wasn't happy saying the line "Let them die." You know when he's he's talking about the. You remember that line in the film where he's yeah. Spock says to him, "The you know you need to go because they're dying," and he says, "Let them die." You know what? From the from the first time I saw that, that didn't that rubbed me the wrong way, and apparently it rubbed William Shatner the wrong way. So he he went to Nick Meyer and said, um, "Look, if you're going to have that line in there, um, let me do a take where I react." Uh, like I said something that I didn't mean to say. So he, so there's a take out there somewhere where uh, Shatner says, let them die. And then he gives an expression to say, I didn't mean that. Meyer agreed. They shot that take. And when Shatner saw the dailies, he saw that that, that portion was cut out. So as we all know, we did not see that in the film. And that did bother me. That was probably the least Kirk-like moment for me in all of the original series uh, presentations. Any thoughts on that real quick? I think so too. I think it bothered me. Simply, I was looking at it from the aspect of these people are so uh, far ahead than we are and they're not supposed to be discriminating like that. But I think Maya wanted to say that because Kirk, because they killed his son, he hated them so much, you know? But anyway. Yeah, I just thought, yeah go ahead. <clears throat> this, this was a time before, you know, there was any type of tr- real treaty and contact, you know, these guys had been in a blood feud for years. You know, Kirk was on the front lines of that. You know, so I can understand why his character would say something like that, especially having lost his son to him as well. You know, yeah. so, but at the same time, I understand, you know, at the same time in your film, you don't want Kirk to come across as, you know, a cold-blooded killer. Now, had they done it in a different context, they could have, you know, let it in there. But just le- like like the way it was presented, made Kirk look like the bad guy. And it puts sympathy on the Klingons, which is something that they didn't need to do at that time. You know, it's funny you say that because one of the things he mentioned, which I did not make a note of, but I do recall, Shatner says that Roddenberry was disgusted by how the Federation was was depicted versus the Klingons, he felt like the Federation was being depicted as the bad guys, that they were the intolerant ones, and the Klingons were the underdog, and he hated, he did not like mm. that. He did not like that. And yeah. speaking of Roddenberry, uh, unfortunately, he screened Star Trek VI, and he died two days after seeing the film, which I found kind of sad. Yeah, very, very and sad. As a result, the film was dedicated to him. So there you have it. The, just you know, just what I thought was over some fun facts as I went through the book, uh, Star Trek movie memories. Any last thoughts about anything that? Um... <laughs> What's that for? What is that? How are you going to go through a book that you listen to? <laughs> <laughs> I went through the book. What? Jeez. You... Oh, you listen to the book. <laughs> Okay, and that would that make it any less uh, yes. valid? Yes. 
Because you, you say, I went through the book. And, you, well, and listen. this visual comes up of you holding the book with your glasses on. Hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> well, in reality, <laughs> you got it in the car, sitting in rush hour traffic. Listen to it. This is what you're focusing on? <laughs> and what you yeah. missed is, I had my Sherlock Holmes pipe. Well, I'm... <laughs> Right. <laughs> but I, I highly recommend downloading the book. I, it's it's affordable. I can't remember. It's only four hours long. Four, the the read's only four hours long, and it's just great hearing William Shatner read his own words, um, and he does it in that Kirk like cadence in, at some points. So it's it really is entertaining. I highly recommend going to iTunes, download uh, Star Trek movie memories. You'll also find Star Trek memories, which I am listening to now <laughs> so we will do another show in the future and with that I know one of our crew members or my number one has a uh, has an appointment over on the USS Farragut so we have to go back to uh, <laughs> space dock it's always this guy that's making us have to go back <laughs> but before we it's go it's been a great show yeah before yes. we go um, Craig we haven't done this in a while Craig just tell tell us where we can find you other than red shirts on Twitter at ibanyan, that's I-B-A-N-Y-A-N, and for the books that I write, craigsbooks.info is probably a good place to go. Nice. And Big Sexy, where can they find you? I can be found on Twitter under W-S-E Mark, and Facebook under Mark Wiggins, and there is still early talk, but I may be in New York in January. So oh. I'll keep you guys posted. All right. That, well, we got to get together and do a live show. Definitely. Definitely. And with that, we're going to head off to Space Dock. I hope you all enjoyed the show. We will see you in two weeks. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Red Shirts is not endorsed by Paramount Pictures, Viacom, or CBS. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. Star Trek, the Star Trek logo, and all names, pictures, and audio of Star Trek characters are registered trademarks and or copyrights of their respective trademark and or copyright holders. 